Part 3, Tiger, Tiger. Chapter 1, Mowgli Finds a New Family. After Mowgli was forced to leave the pack, he went to the nearest village of men, but he decided not to stop there because it was too close to the jungle. Instead, he stayed on the road that went into the valley until he came to unfamiliar country. The valley opened into a great plain. A village was at one end of the plain, and at the other end, the jungle gave way to grazing land, where cattle and buffalo were plenty. A few young boys were tending the herds. When they saw Mowgli, they shouted and ran away. Mowgli kept walking, hoping to find some food. But when he came to the village, he found that the gate was closed. Mowgli was not surprised, because he knew that men were afraid of jungle people. So he sat down to wait. When a man came out, Mowgli stood up, opened his mouth, and pointed inside to show that he wanted food. The man stared and ran back up one street of the village, shouting for the priest. A large man dressed in white came to the gate. At least 100 people staring and shouting were with him. Men folk have no better manners than the great apes, Mowgli whispered as he frowned at the crowd. Look at the marks on his arms and legs. They are wolf bites. He is a wolf child run away from the jungle, the priest stated. Some of the women sighed in sympathy. Poor child, one said. Masua, he looks like your boy who was taken by the tiger. A woman with heavy copper rings on her wrists and ankles peered at Mowgli. He is thinner, she said, but he has the look of my boy. The crowd parted as Masua walked Mowgli to her hut. Masua was married to the wealthiest man in the village. Their home contained a red lacquered bedstand, a great earthen grain chest with raised patterns on it, and some copper cooking pots. A real looking glass hung on the wall. As Masua fed him with milk and bread, she wondered whether Mowgli really was her son. Nathu, she said, using his given name. Mowgli did not recognize the name. She decided that since it appeared that Mowgli didn't have any protectors, she would raise him like her own son. Although Mowgli felt uncomfortable, never having been under a roof, he relaxed when he saw that the windows were not barred. He could get away if he wanted to. From Baloo, Mowgli learned the importance of speaking the other beast's languages. So as soon as Masua said a word, he imitated it almost perfectly. Before dark, he had learned the names of many things in the hut. When it was time to go to sleep, Mowgli went outside. He stretched out in the long grass at the edge of the field, but before he had closed his eyes, a soft gray nose poked him under the chin. It was Gray Brother, the firstborn of Mother Wolf's cubs. Wake, little brother, I bring news, he said. Is everything well in the jungle? Mowgli asked, hugging him. All but the wolves that were burned with the red flower, Gray Brother replied. Shere Khan has gone far away until his coat grows back. He was badly singed from the fire, but he says that when he comes back, he plans to get even with you. Mowgli smiled and said, I also have made a little promise. You won't forget that you are a wolf, will you? Gray Brother asked anxiously. Never, Mowgli reassured him. I will always love my wolf family, but I can't forget that I was cast out of the pack. Men are only men, little brother. Their ways are not our ways. When I come down here again, I will wait for you in the bamboos at the edge of the grazing ground. Chapter 2. Learning the Ways of Men Just as Mowgli learned the law of the jungle, he had to learn the ways of men. This kept him very busy. Some things caused him great annoyance. Wearing a cloth around his body, using money, and plowing to grow food. He couldn't see the use of these customs. The little children in the village made fun of him because he didn't know their games and couldn't say their words correctly. This made Mowgli very angry, but the law says that life in the jungle depends on keeping one's temper and leaving the small and defenseless alone. Everyone was shocked at Mowgli's strength, which by comparison with that of the beasts of the jungle was nothing. Mowgli used his strength to help the villagers, but because he did not understand the notion of class, he caused a good deal of trouble. The priest scolded him for helping a lowly potter whose donkey had slipped into a clay pit the priest told Masua's husband to put Mowgli to work as punishment, but Mowgli was delighted when the village headman said he had to herd buffalo. That night, Mowgli discovered other advantages of being appointed a village servant. He had to attend a meeting of the village club, which took place every evening on a platform under a fig tree. The men told wonderful tales, and Mowgli got to hear all of the village gossip. Boldeo, the hunter, spoke about the jungle beasts until the eyes of the children sitting outside the circle glowed in wonder. Mowgli had to cover his face to show that he was not laughing, while Buldeo, his musket across his knees, moved from one fantastic story to another. 
Baldeo said the tiger that had carried away Masua's son was a ghost tiger. His body was inhabited by the ghost of an old dishonest moneylender who had died some years ago. This is true, he said, because Purin Das always limped from the blow that he got in a riot. The tiger that I speak of limps too. That tiger limps because he was born lame, as everyone knows, Mowgli interrupted. Baldeo was speechless for a moment. Then he said, if you are so wise, jungle brat, bring the hide to the government and collect the money put up for the tiger's life. If you know what is good for you, you won't talk when your elders are speaking. Very little of what Boldeo has told you of the jungle is true, Mowgli said as he rose to go. Boldeo glared at Mowgli, and the headman said that it was time for the boy to go back to herding. The village custom was for a few boys to take the cattle and buffalo out to graze early in the morning, then bring them back at night. So at dawn, Mowgli went through the village street, sitting on the back of Rama, the great herd bull. The other buffalo followed. Mowgli made it very clear to the boys with him that he was master. Mowgli drove the herd to the edge of the plain where the Wangunga River comes out of the jungle. Then he climbed down from Rama's back and walked to the bamboos at the edge of the grazing ground. Just as Gray Brother had promised, he was waiting there for Mowgli. Gray Brother asked why Mowgli was herding the cattle. I've been made a village herd at least for a while, Mowgli said. Do you have news of Shere Khan? Shere Khan came back and waited for you. Game is scarce now, so he went off again. He said he would be back, and he means to kill you. For as long as he is gone, come or send one of the brothers to sit on that rock so I can see you when I come out of the village. When Shere Khan returns, wait for me in the ravine by the tree in the center of the plain, Mowgli instructed. Chapter 3. Shere Khan Returns At last, the day came when Gray Brother was not in the usual place. Mowgli directed the buffalo toward the ravine. Gray Brother sat by the tree, which was covered with golden flowers. The bristles on his back were raised. Last night, Shere Khan crossed the plains with Tabaki following your trail, Gray Brother reported. I am not afraid of Shere Khan, but Tabaki is very cunning, Mowgli said, frowning. Don't worry, Gray Brother said. I met Tabaki at dawn. He said that Shere Khan plans to wait for you at the village gate this evening. Has he eaten or does he hunt on an empty stomach? Mowgli asked. The answer meant life or death to him. He killed a pig at dawn, Gray Brother answered. Shere Khan could never fast, even for the sake of revenge. Shere Khan is a fool, Mowgli said in disgust. Where is he now? He swam far down the Wangunga River, Gray Brother replied. Mowgli stood with his finger in his mouth, thinking. The big ravine of the Wangunga River opens out on the plain, not half a mile from here. I can take the herd around through the jungle to the head of the ravine and then sweep down but he would slink out at the foot. We must block that end. Can you cut the herd in two for me? Mowgli asked. With pleasure, Gray Brother said, smiling. He turned away and dropped into a hole nearby. After a moment, a huge gray head popped up out of the hole. It was Akela. Mowgli clapped his hands. We have a big job to do, Akela. Cut the herd in two. Keep the cows and calves together and the bulls and buffalo by themselves. Mowgli climbed onto Rama's back. Akela, he called, drive the bulls to the left. Gray brother, wait until we are gone, then keep the cows together. Drive them to the foot of the ravine. How far? Gray brother asked. Until the sides are higher than Shere Khan can jump, Mowgli shouted. Keep them there until we come down. Mowgli cheered them on as they worked. The other herd children, watching with the cattle half a mile away, hurried to the village as fast as their, as their legs could carry them, crying that the buffalo had gone mad and run away. Mowgli's plan was simple. He wanted to make a big circle uphill and get to the head of the ravine, then take the bulls down it and catch Shere Khan between the bulls and the cows. He knew that after a meal, Shere Khan would not be in any condition to fight or climb up the sides of the ravine. At last, Mowgli rounded up the herd on a grassy patch that sloped steeply down the ravine. From that height, he could see across the treetops to the plain below. Mowgli saw with a great deal of satisfaction that the sides of the ravine ran nearly straight up and down, while the vines and creepers that hung over them would give no foothold to a tiger who wanted to get out. I must tell Shere Khan who comes. We have him in the trap, Mowgli said, putting his hands to his mouth and shouting down the ravine. The echoes bounced off the rocks. After a long pause, they heard a sleepy snarl. Who calls? Shere Khan asked, and a splendid peacock fluttered up from the ravine, screeching. It is Mowgli, you cattle thief. Mowgli said triumphantly. Hurry them down, Akela. Down, Rama. 
The herd pitched over, one after the other, the sand and stones spurting up around them. Once the stampede began, nothing could stop it. Before they were fairly in the bed of the ravine, Rama winded Shere Khan and bellowed. Shere Khan heard the thunder of their hooves, picked himself up, and hobbled down the ravine. There was no way to escape, and he was willing to do anything but fight. The bellowing herd splashed through the pool he had just left. Mowgli heard an answering bellow from the cows at the foot of the ravine. Shere Khan turned, knowing that it was better to meet the bulls than the mother cows with their calves. Then Rama tripped and trampled over something soft. With the bulls at his heels, he crashed into the other herd. The weaker buffalo were lifted off their feet by the shock of the impact. That charge carried both herds out into the plain, goring and stamping and snorting. Mowgli slipped off Rama's neck, laying about him right and left with his stick. Quick, Akela, scatter them or they will fight one another. Akela and Gray Brother ran about, nipping the beast's legs. The herd turned to charge up the ravine again, but Mowgli managed to direct, redirect Rama, and the others followed him. Shere Khan had been trampled on. He was dead. Brothers, Shere Khan died a dog's death, Mowgli said. He felt for the knife he carried in a sheath around his neck now that he lived with men. His hide will look well on the council rock. We must get to work swiftly. Chapter 4. Cast Out Once More a boy raised by men could not have skinned a 10-foot tiger alone, but Mowgli knew how the skin was fitted on and how to take it off. Mowgli slashed and tore at the skin for an hour while the wolves watched until he called on to help them tug or tear. When he was well into his work, he felt a hand on his shoulder. Mowgli turned and saw Boldeo with his musket. The herd children had told the villagers about the stampede. Boldeo was angry that Mowgli hadn't taken better care of the herd. When Boldeo had realized the situation, he was astounded. It is the lame tiger, and there is a large reward for his hide, he said. We will overlook your carelessness, and perhaps I will give you a tiny bit of the reward. Mowgli disagreed with this plan and let Boldeo know it. I need the skin for my own use, old man, he said. You cannot talk that way to the chief hunter of the village, Boldeo sputtered. I will not give you any money, only a big beating. Mowgli shook his head and called Akela, who was hiding with Gray Brother. The next thing Boldeo knew, he was stretched out on the grass with a huge gray wolf standing over him. Mowgli went on skinning. Boldeo lay still. He was spooked by this boy who could skin a tiger and give orders to a wolf. You must be a great king, he choked out. Yes, Mowgli said, chuckling a little. Let him go, Akela. When Boldeo got to the village, he told a story of sorcery that made the priest look very grave. Mowgli went on with his work. It was nearly twilight when he and the wolves had drawn the skin clear off Shere Khan's body. We must hide this and take the buffalo home. Help me, Akela, Mowgli said. After they rounded up the herd, they traveled on to the village. Mowgli saw lights and heard the temple bells ringing. The villagers waited for him at the gate. A shower of stones whistled about his ears and the villagers shouted, Sorcerer! Wolf sprat, jungle demon, go away. Boldeo, shoot. Boldeo's musket went off with a bang. The bullet missed Mowgli. More sorcery, shouted the villagers. If he can turn away bullets. Boldeo, that shot hit your buffalo. Mowgli had not expected this kind of reaction. Akela told him that the villagers were like the pack. They are casting you out, the wolf said. Last time I was cast out was because I was a man. This time it is because I am a wolf. Let us go, Akela. Mowgli said sadly. By the light of the moon shining over the plain, the villagers saw Mowgli and the two wolves making their way back to the jungle. Chapter 5. Return to Council Rock. The new moon was just going down when Mowgli and the two wolves came to the Council Rock. They stopped at Mother Wolf's cave. I have been cast out of the man pack, Mother, Mowgli shouted, but I have Shere Khan's hide with me to keep my word to my first pack. It is well done, Mother Wolf said. Yes, it is well done, Bagheera's deep voice rose out of the thicket. He ran to Mowgli, and together they clambered up the council rock. The boy spread the skin out on the flat stone where Akela used to sit and pegged it down with four slivers of bamboo. Akela lay down upon it. Look well, Akela called, exactly as he had called when Mowgli was first brought here. The pack had had no leader since Akela was overthrown. Out of habit, they returned his call. Some of them were lame from the traps they had fallen into. Some limped from bullet wounds, but they came out and saw Shere Khan's hide and the huge claws dangling at the end of the empty, dangling feet. Have I kept my word, Mowgli asked. 
the wolves bayed. Yes, one tattered wolf howled. Lead us again, Akela. Lead us again, man cub. We are tired of this lawlessness. We want to be the free people again. No, Bagheera purred. You have fought for this. It is yours. Both the man pack and the wolf pack have cast me out, Mowgli said. Now I will hunt alone in the jungle. And we will hunt with you, his brother cub said. About the author, Rudyard Kipling was born in Bombay, India in 1865. His parents were both artistic and literary. For unknown reasons, Kipling was left at the age of six with a foster family in England. He lived there for five years. In later years, he wrote about his hardships in a short story, Baba Ba Black Sheep, 1888, and in a novel, The Light That Failed, 1890. After his college graduation in 1882, Kipling started work as a journalist in India. He published Plain Tales from the Hills in 1888, which became an instant success. Kipling married an American author, Caroline Ballastier, in 1892. They moved to Vermont for four years, where Kipling wrote his most famous novel, The Jungle Book, 1894. In 1907, Kipling was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, making him the first English writer to receive this honor. Throughout his career, Kipling wrote hundreds of short stories, poems, and novels for children and adults. He died in London in 1936. Thank you for reading Jungle Book with me, and I hope that you enjoyed this story by Rudyard Kipling.